his conversation with Unferth, the flitting episode. And if you remember, what we discussed was he gets challenged by Unferth, and then he kind of goes a little bit beyond in his response by, at least this is how I read it, by making insinuations about the Danes. Um, not, not many other Anglo-Saxon scholars see that sarcasm, okay, about the Danes. I don't know how you miss it, uh, because to me it's pretty clear when he s s makes the comments about, you know, Unferth, if you were essentially half the man you say you are, Grindel would have no problem, okay? But then he extrapolates and starts to talk about the Victory Danes, the Spear Danes, the Shield Danes, and says, I'm going to show you how to gate or how a Gietish man fights, etc. And we're told then, line 607, then the giver of treasure was greatly pleased, gray-haired and battle-bold. This is Hrothgar, okay? The bright Danes chief had faith in his helper. That shepherd of his folk recognized Beowulf's firm resolution. That is, that Beowulf was firmly resolved to do what he says he's going to do. There was the laughter of warriors, lovely sounds, and winsome words. That is, it's kind of, if, if I were directing this, I would have Beowulf give his speech, and then there is just silence. Like, everybody's not sure how to take it. And then Hrothgar slowly starts... And then the men all join in, okay? Because Beowulf's words can be taken as a challenge. Hrothgar doesn't take them that way, okay? I think Hrothgar takes them as, this is Beowulf, you know, if he were a uh, peacock, this is the full plumage coming out and saying, I can do what I say I can do, okay? So, Hrothgar's wife enters the scene, okay? Well, thou went forth, Hrothgar's queen, mindful of customs. What does it mean, mindful of customs? Well, that gets picked up with line 615. She comes in and she offers a cup. She has a cup of mead or ale, okay? She gives it first to Hrothgar. Why? Because that's customary. Not only is he her husband, he's also the king, okay? But then what does she do? She then goes to Beowulf, okay? The lady of the Helmings, that is, that's the tribe she's from. She's not Danish, excuse me, she's not Danish. She's a Helming. She's probably one of two things. Either spoils of war, Hrothgar won her in war, or she was given as what's called a peace weaver. She was given in marriage to bring pre peace between the Danes and the Helmings, okay? She goes about to young and old. She gives each his portion of the precious cup until she comes up to Beowulf, okay? She greets him, we're told. She thanks God with wise words, line 626, that her wish should come to pass. What is her wish? That she could rely on any earl for relief from those crimes. In other words, the implication is she's been praying to God for the last 12 years, please God, send an earl who can stop these crimes, okay? Beowulf takes the cup from her and he makes an announcement. I resolved, <clears throat> I resolved when I set out over the waves, sat down in my ship with my troop of soldiers, that I would entirely fulfill the wishes of your people or fall slain. Fast in the grip of my foe. I shall perform a deed of manly courage, or in this meet all I will await the end of my days. Notice that's a shorter speech than he gave earlier. What's he essentially saying? I will cleanse her of your pest or die trying. That's a pretty powerful boast. I will solve your problem or I will die in the effort. Notice. These words well pleased that woman. Do you, do you think maybe other men tried to please that woman with words? What are we told before? Okay. We're told before by Hrothgar himself, other men 
have attempted to stay in here out overnight and kill Grindel. And they have to wash out the remains in the morning. Okay? So, then as before, there in the hall were strong words spoken, that is, boasting. Okay? The people are happy. The sounds of a victorious nation. Are they victorious yet? <laughs> That's still yet to be seen. Until shortly, the son of Halfdane wished to seek his evening rest. Lines 645 and 646. Okay. He knew that the wretched beast had been planning to do battle in the high building from the time they could first see the sunrise until night fell darkening over all. In other words, Hrothgar knew the moment the sun rose in the morning that when the sun starts to set, Grindel's going to be making his way to Herod. So, the implication is the sun is setting. Hrothgar is saying, time to leave. The company arose. Why? Because Hrothgar stands up first. One warrior greeted another there, who, Hrothgar to Beowulf, okay, wished him luck. Gave him control of the wine hall in these words. I've never trusted to any man ever since I could hold an oyster shield in the Great Hall of the Danes, except to you now. Probably what that means is not that he's never entrusted the hall to anyone. Okay? Probably what this means is that he's never told anyone before Beowulf. Remember that throne, that yif stool? It's yours for the night. That is, when Hrothgar's previous, now dead retainers, wanted to challenge Grendel, he didn't tell them, you can sit in the big chair. He said, go ahead, you know, try and kill him if you can. Okay? What he's doing here is he's essentially telling Beowulf, you're king for the night. Okay? Except to you now. Have it and hold it. Okay? Hold it is kind of a way of saying rule it. The word that he uses for hold there. Got to find the line again. Uh, 658. Havenu on Yahel. Who is the cellist? Have now and hold. Reign, control, rule, the best of houses. Be mindful of glory. Okay. What does that mean, be mindful of glory? Be thinking about it. Why? Because if you do what you say you can do, oh, you can. Be mindful of glory, show your mighty valor, watch for your enemies. Watch means be alert. Stay awake. Don't fall asleep. Okay? You will have all you desire if you emerge from this brave undertaking alive. Say, now, what does that mean? You will have all you desire. Riches unimaginable. Okay? Rothgar is saying, I will reward you well. So, then Hrothgar and his troop of heroes, protector of the shieldings, departed the hall. Troop of heroes. Kind of ambiguous. The war chief wished to seek Welthael, his queen's bedchamber. That's not what the Old English says. The Old English says, lines 663 and following, That the we Fruma, the leader of battle, wealth thou Satan, okay, so wealth thou, uh, sorry, this is the W. Satan, Queen, To.
the bed. To seek wealth now, the queen to bed. It's not saying he wants to go to her bedchamber. It's saying he wants to go have sex with his wife. That's what the poet is saying. He wants to go bed his wife. While, what's going on in Herod? While Beowulf's just going to take on, you know, the mighty demon who's been terrorizing him for 12 years. Right? What kind of image does this portray for us about Hrothgar? It's not a positive image. Okay. Not a positive image. He's Okay. Taking a back seat, it's a nice way of putting it. Okay. Okay. That's a positive spin on it. What's a what's a negative way of looking at it? Or it's like it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, but it's not necessarily gonna be his last night, because Grindel never comes to the outbuildings. He never comes to any of the any of the other buildings associated with Hera. He only hits Hera itself. Right? So he's not worried about what happens to his fall, what happens to his kingdom. Yeah. Is it this kind of, you know, um, like fiddling while Rome burns? Uh, yeah. Wouldn't you expect the king? Put it in a president, put it in an our American political context. Wouldn't you expect a president while, let's say, you know, San Francisco is being invaded by the Norks, the North Koreans or something? Wouldn't you expect a president to be busy? Not this kind of busy? <laughs> to be busy in the situation room with all of his or her advisors and counselors, rather than often the residents of the Oval, uh, not the Oval Office, uh, the White House. It's kind of a jarring juxtaposition, okay? The glorious king had set against Grendel a hall guardian, okay? Notice your gloss. Or king of glory. The old English there is have the king ruler, had literal King of glory. Okay. Set against Grendel a hall guardian. Who is that? Is that Hrothgar? Well, that's the hall guardian. Who's well, the glorious I'm, king? Yeah, is it God? Okay. Has Hrothgar just in the previous kind of half line or two been described as a glorious king? What's he doing? Screwing his wife. Literally. Okay. That's not a king of glory, so to speak. So it's probably an allusion to God. It's said against Grindel Hargardian. Hargardian, as men had heard said. Who did special service for the kings of the Danes, kept guard against a giant. So, surely... The Gaitish prince greatly trusted his mighty strength, the maker's favor. Notice, the maker's favor is an appositive phrase. It's restating his mighty strength. Where have we been told Beowulf got his strength from? We're told God. I mean, Hrothgar tells us that. Okay. So, Beowulf trusts in his strength. And it's like the poet then says, which is the favor of God? Okay. How do we know he trusts in his strength? Because he takes off his iron mail shirt. Not like in the stupid Angelina Jolie version of Beowulf. He's not stripping down to the buff. He's not stripping down naked. Okay. He's taking off his coat of mail. Why? Because it's uncomfortable to lay down in a coat of mail. It's even more uncomfortable to get up with a coat of mail on or a mail shirt on. Okay? So he takes off his mail shirt. He takes off his helmet. He sets his sword down, gives it to his servant. Okay? And then Beowulf speaks a few words of boasting. 
Who is there to listen? His men, okay? His 14 men. I consider myself no poor in strength and battle deeds, and Grendel does himself, so I will not kill him with the sword. No, notice the assumption. I am going to kill him. I just want to do it with a sword. Put an end to his life, though I easily might. He knows no arts of war, no way to strike back. Hack at my shield boss, though he be brave in his wicked deeds. But tonight we too will forego our swords, if he dare to seek out a war without weapons. And then let the wise Lord, the holy God, grant the judgment of glory to whichever hand seems proper to him. Okay, this is Beowulf speaking. This is not the quote-unquote Christian poet. Okay, This is pagan, 6th century if you want, Beowulf. Notice where he puts his trust. Is his trust in his own hands? It's as God wills it. Okay? Arabic, inshallah, if you want. Okay? Means as Allah wills it. Okay? So, as God wills, what's he mean? Two go in, one come out. The one that comes out, that's the one God decided will win. That's what Beowulf means by that. So, he lay down. The bolster took the earl's cheek, that is the pillow, takes his cheek, and around him many a bold seafarer sank to his hall rest. Okay? Beowulf goes to sleep, or lies down at least, thinking what? What are his thoughts? What are his, what's going on in his mind? It's cool. All will be well. Okay. It will work out according kind of to God's will. Okay. What about his men? They also lay down to go to sleep. Okay. The hall looks like this. It's got probably double doors here. And the men lay down. How do they lay down? Okay. They know Grindel's going to come in through here. Okay. If you're a coward like me, you know, you're back here. <laughs> but that's not what they do. Okay, yeah. The hearth is in the middle of the room. So they're going to be somewhat near that. But they're probably laying down in rows. Let's say so. Like that. Or let's not put one right, right in front of the door. Let's put an eighth one there. Okay. You're one of Beowulf's men. Where do you want Beowulf to bed down for the night? I'd say Beowulf. Here's a good place for you. Put him right here. Right in front of the door so that Grindel you know, has to step over him to come in. Okay? That's not what happens. Where does Beowulf sleep? Not in the middle. Nope. Because he's the second person Grindel reaches for. He's either here or here. Sucks to be one of these guys. <laughs> what are what are I know these guys obviously? The expendable. <laughs> okay. They're proverbial cannon fodder. Okay. So, the men lie down. What's going through their minds? This is it. We're all daughters. None of them thought that he should thence ever again seek his own dear homeland. So, they think he's going to die. They think, okay, they think Beowulf's not going to kill Grindel. Moreover, Grindel's going to eat all of them. How much faith and trust do they have in Beowulf or Beowulf's God? Not much. Not much. It's a good example of old English lightities. It means none. Okay. His tribe or the town in which he was raised, for they had heard it said that savage death had swept away far too many of the Danish folk in that white hall. In other words, they would heard stories. But the Lord gave a web of web of victory to the people of the waiters, that is, to these troops, so that they completely overcame their enemy through 
one man's craft or skill, if you want. And then you get this little gnomic passage. It is a well-known truth that mighty God has ruled mankind always and forever. Okay? Line 700. So is Yekutit. Truth is known that mighty God, the race of man, not has ruled, wailed, ruled. Okay? We the earth, now and then, means present and in the past. What is the poet saying there? It's widely known. God controls the fate of men. Okay? This is a very Boethian idea. From Boethius, 6th century, late 5th century, Roman author, okay, who was imprisoned by the emperor, a German emperor at this point, of the Holy Roman Empire, or the Roman Empire, a guy named Theodoric. Uh, he was an Ostrogoth emperor, uh, who was imprisoned by him. Okay? Boethius was imprisoned because he was charged with conspiring to kill Theodoric. He apparently, from available sources, he didn't. He was framed. He was best friends with Theodoric, but Theodoric had him thrown in prison. While in prison, waiting death, Boethius writes a little book called The Consolation of Philosophy. He doesn't mean pick up a little Aristotle and, you know, and all your problems will go away. It's not what he means by the consolation of philosophy. Philosophy in the title is a goddess who comes to Boethius in his prison to teach him, essentially, why bad things happen to good people. He's sitting there wondering, why me, God? What did I do? And philosophy comes and teaches him the order of the universe, how everything runs. Okay? Because what is Boethius, how is Boethius looking at the world? This applies to also Rothgar and the Danes. How are they looking at their experiences? Okay, negatively, why? From their perspective, right? What's their perspective? Kind of sucks. You got Grindel coming every night for 12 years. Probably after three or four years of every night, what kind of change do you start expecting to happen? No. Okay. So they're looking at the troubles, the problems of this world, through the lenses of their experience. We all do this, right? You have a quote-unquote string of bad luck. What starts to happen to your outlook on life? You know, takes a nosedive. Okay. So this is what Boethius ex is experiencing. And so philosophy teaches them, Boethius, you need to learn to look at the larger picture. Here's the larger picture, okay? This is our lives, not flatline as in dead, but birth, death. What can, what do we often find a hard time doing? Okay. Think of this as a plane that we live on. It's pretty hard to step what? Outside that plane. Because stepping outside that plane, okay, think you're walking along this timeline, stepping outside that plane would allow you to do what? To do what? Say you could do this. Come up here. Okay? And become an eyeball. What would that allow you to do? See the big picture. See? Exactly. See the big picture, look at your life, look at all the little decisions you've made. And notice, the decisions would not look like this, right? It looked like Robert Frost, you know, uh, no, the poem about the yellow wood, the title is escaping me up. The road, let's, road not taken, right? Where you meet a fork in the road and what do you do? As Yogi Berra said, you took it. 
you don't take a fork in the road. You take one angle. So you take this fork. What does that do to this one? That decision is now gone. You do what? You meet another fork. You take one side. Okay. Notice it's not straight. From down here, how does it look? Like a Jackson Pollock painting. It's just <laughs> chaos. But from up here, you start to see how way leads on to way in the poem. Okay. And what does it create? It doesn't create a Jackson Pollock painting. It creates something like this. Notice, on the outside, it has a pattern. But if we were to turn it inside out, or better yet, would be a tapestry. The front of the tapestry paints or, or creates this beautiful image. You turn the tapestry the other side out, and what do you have? You don't have an image. You got a bunch of threads, right? And the threads don't make any sense on that backside. So what Boethius learns is that life down here, okay, is the backside of the tapestry. But once you step above, you start to see the picture. Why? Because down here, and down here, I'm going to use this now. This is Earth. And this is our life here. Down here on Earth, everything is partially governed by fortune. Okay? Middle Ages conceived of the goddess fortune as having a wheel. So think of the circle for the Earth now as being a wheel. And the wheel is constantly turning. Okay? It's good to be on this side of fortune's wheel. Why? Because you're rising. You don't really ever want to get up here. Because fortune kind of tends to be finicky. And when you get up here, she suddenly turns that wheel fast. And what happens? You have Oedipus, rise, rise, rise. You have Hamlet, rise, rise, rise. You've got Julius Caesar, rise. And what happens? They all suddenly fall. Okay? So, fortune kind of rules the affairs of men on earth as a goddess on earth. Behind fortune, according to Boethius, you have fate. Fate governs fortune. Fortune doesn't have anything to do with fate. Fortune doesn't overrule fate. Fortune is an agent of God. Right? And then you have fate. Even in the Greek cosmology, you've got fate back there. The gods don't control fate. Fate doesn't control the gods. The gods can see fate. The gods can know what fate is going to do, but they can't change it. Right? That's why you have you know, prophecies and such in the Greek system. But this is where Boethius adds the Christian element. Behind, above fate, you have providence. Providence. This is God's governorship of the entire universe. In other words, everything that happens, happens according to this. It's St. Paul's Romans 8.28. All things work out too good for those who love God, etc. Okay? And it's this that Boethius comes to show. This gives us this perspective. Because right now we're in the midst of it. We don't see that big perspective. Okay? In God's perspective, however, you got to go what? Where... Where does God exist, so to speak? Yeah, what a question. Okay. Depending on your theology. Okay. Outside time, though. God is not bound by time. So what does God see when he looks into time? C.S. Lewis calls it the eternal present. Think of that. Eternal, outside time, present. Why? It's all now. From up here, all of this is the blink of an eye. It's an instant. Okay? So 
once Boethius comes to understand this, he's kind of okay with, I'm going to die soon for a crime I didn't commit. You know, kind of a resignation, let's say. Isn't it kind of an whole idea of the, uh, the great fantasy memes? The great? The great fantasy memes was the whole idea about, because um, from what I understand uh, is that the reason that we can't see the whole mess of pocket deals at all is that if we, if we were able to see it, we kind of like try to fast forward and jump into the good parts of it, and we break and kind of like rupture the natural world of things. Uh, yes and no. The great chain of being we'll talk about when we, when we get up to the Renaissance. Um, that's more of this, more of the Greek idea of fate, that you can't outrun fate, you can't do an in run around fate, because when you try, what do you do? You actually call fate into being. You actually create what you're fated to do. Okay? So his men don't have any of this. Okay? Notice Beowulf has kind of this native, native meaning native to his birth, as it were. Faith in God. This is not a Germanic faith in any sense. His men put their heads down thinking, that's it, we're gone, <laughs> we're all going to die. Okay. And then the poet says, it's that line, it's well-known truth, mighty God has ruled mankind always and forever. Notice the very next line, in the dark he came. So, mighty God is ruling, but Grendel still comes. What's the poet suggesting? God is allowing him. Exactly. God is in control. Does that mean life's going to be hunky-dory and easy and smooth and without any problems? No, it does not. Okay? So, Grindel comes, and we're told, line 706, it was well known to men that the demon foe could not drive them under the dark shadows if the maker did not wish it. Okay? If God did not desire for Grendel to come, Grendel would not come. Now, what is the poet saying? The poet, to me, seems to be saying God desired Grendel to come. After all, if you read the, the um, Exodus passage from the book of Exodus about the Hebrews leaving Egypt... What does God send? What's the final plague that changes Pharaoh's mind? The angel of death who comes from God. Okay? So, but he, wakeful, keeping watch for his enemy, awaited, enraged the outcome of battle. That is, Beowulf's lying down, but he's wide awake. He's ready for this. So, Get a bunch of descriptions of Grendel coming. And how he's, you know, as he's coming, he's kind of going, <laughs> I'm hungry and I'm going to eat them all. You know, he's exulting in what is going to happen, he thinks. So he comes, he touches the door, the door bursts open. And what happens? He strode across the paved floor, line 725. He saw in the hall many a soldier, a peaceful troop, sleeping all together. Notice they're all asleep. Except for one, a large company of thanes, and he laughed inside. He meant to divide the body from the life. But it was not his fate to taste any more the race of mankind after that night. Line 735. What has the poet just done? Spoiled it. <laughs> Spoiled it. What about suspense? Took it away. Why? Apparently, Anglo-Saxon poetry and even broader configured Germanic poetry, suspense isn't an issue. They don't have the desire or need for suspense that we have in modern literature. Because in uh, this poem, in Battle of Malden, other poems, you find out what's going to happen kind of at the end. You're told early on. It'd be like told, being told in book one of the Harry Potter series, yeah, Harry kills Voldemort. Okay, then why buy all seven books? We're not even a fourth of the way through the poem. Okay? And the poet tells us, Grindel's going to die. So, it was not his fate to taste any more of the race of mankind after the night. Why? Because the kinsman of Helak, the mighty one, beheld how that man-eater planned to proceed with his sudden assault. 
What does that mean? He beheld how that man eater planned to proceed. How? How did he see it? Literally with his eyes. What did he see? He saw Gringle come in and Sorry, Hanchu, you're a dead man. What did Beowulf do to stop Grindel from killing his man? No. What did he do to stop Grindel from killing Hanchu? Nothing. Nothing. He didn't raise a finger to stop him. He didn't say, hey, quit eating that man. Punch him? Yeah. You think he drew he straws? Was like, He's like, damn. He was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time to sacrifice. <laughs> He's the or maybe Beowulf just didn't like him. I read that as he like was he was their alarm clock. Like, He's you gotta try to sleep and <laughs> someone's gotta go. I mean, what does the poem tell us? The poem tells us the Thanes are all asleep. I don't know if I would have the short end of the stick, I wouldn't be asleep. I'd be sitting there sweating like a pig, you know, just waiting for dinner to come eat me, or, you know, me to be dinner for Grindel, et cetera. Beowulf doesn't do anything. This guy is sacrificed, as it were, on the altar of expediency so that Beowulf could learn what his, Grindel's, M.O. is. Not that the monster meant to delay. He seized at once at his first pass. A sleeping man slit him open suddenly, bit into his joints, drank the blood from his veins, gobbled his flesh in goblets, and soon had completely devoured that dead man feet and fingertips. The whole man, gone. Okay, these aren't little men. <laughs> these aren't midgets. They're not, you know, five foot five. They're not Daniel Radcliffe's. These are, these are <laughs> all... These are all Chris Hemsworths. These are big, well-built, strong, power, and Grindel eats him up. Okay? So once he finishes Hanshu, we find out the guy's name later. Once he finishes Hanshu, what does he do? He reaches for the next one. Notice, this must be quiet eating. Because the other guys are still all asleep. Or... Or, what did they do during the night's feast? I mean, if they're all thinking we're not going home, I don't know about you, but I'm getting plastered. Okay? <laughs> really plastered. So, he reaches forward for Grin for Beowulf. Reaches to kind of pick him up. And as Grendel reaches, Beowulf reaches out, takes him by the hand. Kind of like, hi, my name's Beowulf. Nice to meet you. Beowulf, it's me, Nama. Uh, me going to kill you. <laughs> he quickly grabbed him with evil intent and sat up against his arm. Okay? Notice your footnote. It's not clear who grabs who. I think Grendel reaches out and Beowulf reaches out also. Okay? And Beowulf then grabs Grendel's arm and sits up against it. I don't know what that means. How do you sit against an arm? I picture him like that. Yeah, is he, you know, hanging, you know, Grendel swinging him, you know, kind of a thing like I used to do with my little kids when my kids were little? Or does he use it and pull himself into a sitting position with it? All right. And we're told. As soon as that shepherd of sins, Grindel, discovered that he had never met on Middle Earth in any region of the world, another man with a greater anger, in his heart he was afraid for his life. What does he immediately think? Okay. Two words. Oh, sh <laughs> <laughs> But he couldn't flee. Why not? Because he's sitting there trying to shake Beowulf off his hand and he won't let go. His mind was eager to escape to the darkness. Wait a minute. He couldn't flee because they were going on to his hand. But Grendel had two feet. He couldn't run. Well, I mean, he does move. Because they end up, the description we have is that they're each holding on to the other's hand and they're throwing each other up against the wall. So they're moving around within the hall. Beowulf's men do eventually wake up. 
They start whacking at Grendel with their sword, but they won't do any good. Why? Because he has a spell woven around him. Okay? But Beowulf never hits him with a sword. Beowulf just wrestles. He doesn't wrestle. You know, he gets him pinned. He doesn't get him in headlock. It's He's just holding on to the hand. And they're throwing each other, but holding on. Okay? Grendel can't escape because Beowulf's holding on to him. But bear in mind, let's say Beowulf is large, seven feet, okay? Massively built, you know, it's 400 pounds of solid muscle. How big is Grendel? He just ate a man entirely. It's not like he has, you know, an ostomy bag over here where he can eat and get all the stuff. Honcho went in his belly, so his belly has got to be bigger than a man. He has eaten 30 men at once. He doesn't have a fast metabolism. You know, it's, he's huge. He's a giant. Okay? So, the good kinsmen of Helak remembered then his evening speech and stood upright and seized him fast. That is, Beowulf's holding him. He's like, oh yeah, I made a boast. I was going to kill him. I better get up. You know? <laughs> his fingers burst. Who's the his? Grindel. It's Grindles. What's Beowulf doing? <laughs> okay. The strength of 30 men in each hand grip. Each hand grip. Okay. So he squeezes, and Grindel's fingers start to pop. The giant turned outward. The earl stepped inward. That is, Grindel goes, see ya, <laughs> tries to turn away, and Beowulf turns into him blocking his passage. The notorious one, that's Grindel, meant, if he could, to turn away further and flee. Away to his lair in the fin, he knew his fingers were held in a hostile grip. That was an unhappy journey that the harm doer took to him. Harm doer. Sounds like George Bush. <laughs> Those evil doers. No. That the harm doer took to Herod. Okay? The great hall resounded. Why? This is them throwing each other up against the wall. This isn't the hall suddenly taking on, you know, singing qualities. To the Danes, it seemed, the city's inhabitants and every brave earl, like a wild ale sherry. In other words, a kager. To the people outside the hall, it sounds like a party. There's just noise galore. Okay. Both were angry. Fierce house wardens, line 770. The hall echoed. Why are they both house wardens? Who's been ruling Herat for the last 12 years? Grindel. Grindel. Who was given possession of Herat for the night? Beowulf. Beowulf. Okay. From the floor there flew many a mead bench, as men have told me, gold adorned, where those grim foes fought. The shielding heirs had never expected that any man could break it apart, etc., etc. The noise swelled. And they hear a wailing cry, line 786. God's adversary shrieked a grisly song of horror, defeated the captive of hell, bewailed his pain. He pinned him fast. He who was the strongest of mind among men in those days of his life. So, Beowulf's thinking, I'm not letting him go. If I do, he'll flee, but he'll come back later. So he's thinking, i got to hold on to him. Line 798, many an earl in uh, 794. In Beowulf's troop, drew his old blade. They try to help Beowulf, but they can't help, okay, because of the um, spell woven on Grendel. <coughs> um, 805. His separation from the world in those days of this life would be a wretched work, and that alien spirit would travel far into the keeping of fiends. Then he discovered, who had done before so much harm to the race of mankind, that he was marked by God, that his body could bear it no longer. But the courageous kinsman of Helak had him in hand. Hateful to each was the life of the other. In other words, one of them's got to kill the other. Okay? The loathsome creature felt a great pain in his body. A gaping wound opened in his shoulder joint. His sinews sprang apart. His joints 
burst asunder. What's happening? His arm is being, initially, shoulders being dislocated. If you've ever had a dislocated joint, you know it's not fun. Then the tendons in the muscle okay, start to tear. And then the muscle starts to tear. And then it completely separates. And then all that's connecting is the skin. And then it starts to tear. Okay. About, geez, what year is it now? Almost seven years ago, I stepped out my garage door after we'd had snow and ice for a few days. Stepped out my, my garage door and slipped on a, like a four inch thick patch of ice. Broke my fall like this, okay? Totally severed my rotator cuff. I mean, everything. So my arm was like this. You could come get my arm and do this, and it would just swing. I mean, Went to the emergency room because I was nearly passing out from the pain. And the guy said, Kevin, I need you to raise your arm like this. I was like, you don't understand. <laughs> there is no raising my arm like this. He said, well, we'll get somebody. To you know, the pain was absolutely excruciating. So I can sympathize a little bit with Gringo here. <laughs> Not that I've ever eaten anybody. but yeah. <laughs> um, So his arm gets torn off. And we're told the wishes of the Danes were entirely fulfilled in that bloody onslaught, line 824 or so. He who had come from afar had cleansed, wise and stout hearted, the hall of Hrothgar, warded off attack. He rejoiced in his night work, his great deed of courage. The man of the gates had fulfilled his boast. Notice how many times the poet's going to tell us this. Okay. He'd entirely remedied all their distress. The insidious sorrows they had suffered and had to endure from sad necessity, no small affliction. That was a clear sign. What's the clear sign? Okay, it's a sign. It's a symbol. It's a the old English word that's used, token, is token. It also means beacon. Beowulf hangs Grindel's arm from the ceiling. Okay. Does he hang it fleshy side? towards the ceiling? Or does he hang it hand side toward the ceiling, fleshy open wound side hanging down? Because if he does that, then what's happening? Yeah, it stuff's dripping out of it. Okay? And the morning comes. Warriors come in from far and near. And they see the loathsome one's tracks. What tracks? Well, as Grendel flees, what's happening? Think Monty Python. <laughs> Every step he takes, <laughs> so there's a bloody trail. All right. His parting from life hardly seemed sad to any man who examined the trail of that inglorious one, till he went to a pool of sea monsters, doomed, put to flight, and left a fatal trail. The water was welling with blood. They're thinking it's Grendel's blood. That he had jumped in the pool, pond, mirror, if you want, okay, and his body is still producing this blood. Okay. And notice what the poet says. He laid down his life, his heathen soul, and hell took him. There's no, the poet is saying, the Christian poet, there's no redemption for, for Grendel. There's no possibility that he found his savior, you know, so to speak. So, the old retainers returned from there. That is, they saw what happened in the hall. They followed Grendel's trail to his mirror, to his home. And then they start to ride back, okay? And many a youth on the joyful journey, they rode their, rode their horses back from the mirror, men on their steeds. And what do they do? They celebrate Beowulf's glory, how? They sing. Okay? It was often said that south and north, between the two seas, across the wide world, there was none better under the broad billowing sky among shield war warriors, nor more worthy to rule. What are they saying? They Beowulf, Beowulf, he's our man. If he's not the best king in the world, no one can, so to speak. He is the most worthy of rule. And then the poet adds this. Line 862. Though lost my place. 
Though they found no fault with their own friendly lord, gracious Hrothgar. Ak, that was good king. But that was a good king. Okay? We've seen that was God kidding earlier in reference to shield shoving. There it's, there's no undercutting in that reference. But by saying, Ach, but Hrothgar's a good king too. The poet is suggesting okay, that they're not praising Beowulf to the exclusion of Hrothgar. But they're praising Beowulf to the exclusion of Hrothgar. After all, could Hrothgar defeat Grendel? Mm. How old is Hrothgar? Just hold that question. So, um, at times they let their horses prance, they race, etc. And we're told, line 867. Sometimes the king's thing, full of grand stories, mindful of songs, does what? He remembers old tales and were told. He, line 870, found other words truly bound together. Okay. And what the poet is telling us there is that the king's thing, his show, does what? He remembers words from his word hoard. His vocabulary and he does what he strongly or truly binds them together he creates a song about Beowulf okay? and what does he do he tells the story of Sigmund who is singular he is a great hero in Germanic mythology who killed a dragon okay? and the poet in the poem, not the poet of the poem, the poet in the poem compares Beowulf with Sigmund. Okay? Not knowing, the poet within the story, not knowing that in 70 years, maybe, however long it is, Beowulf is also going to become a dragon slayer. Okay? So we get Beowulf compared to a great Germanic hero. And then the poet brings in somebody else. Okay? Not the Fitla, okay, but another character from Germanic mythology. Um, and let me, just before that, what happens with Sigmund? Sigmund stabs the dragon until line 891. 890 and 91. It so befell him that his sword, this is Sigmund's sword, pierced the wondrous serpent, stood fixed in the wall. So he pierces the dragon, and the sword sticks in the wall. Okay? The dragon dies. We're not ever told what happens to the sword at this point. Interestingly, when Beowulf goes and kills Grendel's mother, he finds a sword on the wall. I think, and nobody's ever suggested this before, and there's, there's no criticism about it. I think it could be Sigmund's sword, and that's the reason the poet, the poet of the poem, is bringing Sigmund in. He wants the sword Beowulf uses to kill Grendel's mother to be the same sword that killed the dragon. Okay? Could be, could not be. So, anyways, 898. He, Sigmund, was the most famous of exiles far and wide, among all people, protector of warriors for his noble deeds. He had prospered for them since the struggles of Haramod had ceased. Who is Haramod? Okay. Among the Jutes, or perhaps Aeton, he was betrayed into his enemy's hands, quickly dispatched. Okay. He was betrayed. What does that betray tell us? Who had to betray him into his enemy's hand? His own people. Your enemies don't betray you. you they do what enemies do. Okay? But I thought fourfold Germanic ethic. Duty to Lord. Duty to kin. Duty to avenge your Lord. 
Where is the betraying your Lord within that epic? Okay. So why did they betray him? Line 904. The surging of cares had crippled him too long. It crippled him. Paramount. Okay. He became a deadly burden to his own people, to all noblemen. For many a wise man had mourned in earlier times over his headstrong ways, who would look to him for relief from affliction, hoped that that prince's son would prosper, receive his father's rank, rule his people, horde and fortress, a kingdom of heroes, the shielding homeland. What are we being told there about Haramon? He wasn't a good king. He didn't provide relief from affliction for his people. He didn't distribute wealth and treasure. He hoarded it for himself. See, that whole Germanic ethic, that presupposes a good king. Duty to a good king. That means that your king is going to distribute wealth and is going to protect you. Right? The kinsmen of Helak became to all the race of mankind a more pleasant friend. The poet has just, without telling us, okay, I'm shifting now to Beowulf. The poet has just shifted to Beowulf. What's he doing? He's compared Beowulf now with Sigamund. He's also compared him with Haramod. Notice, the kinsmen of Helak, Beowulf, became to all the race of mankind a more pleasant friend, a better king. Right? Sin possessed him. Who's the him? Not Beowulf. It's the Haramod that was discussed before. All right? So, they make their way back. And Hrothgar speaks. And he says, Praise God! For this sight, let us swiftly offer thanks to the Almighty. Much have I endured of dire grief from Grindel, but God may always work shepherd of glory, wonder upon wonder. Um... Where did Hrothgar have that mentality before Beowulf came? <laughs> he didn't. Where was he trusting in God's, you know, providence before? He wasn't. That's why the poet has those lines 175 to 88 when he says, It will be painful, woe to him who does not seek the Father's embrace, and it will be, who does not expect any change, that's Hrothgar, and it will be well for him who does, or who can seek the Father's embrace after his death day. Okay? What did we hear Beowulf say before Grendel came? It's up to God. Okay? So, Hrothgar now. God may always work the shepherd of glory wonder upon wonder. It was not long ago that I did not expect ever in my life to experience relief from any of my foes, or any of my woes. It was not long ago. How long ago was it? <laughs> Yesterday. How long has Beowulf been there? One night. He came yesterday. Yesterday morning when Hrothgar woke up, did he think that would be the last night Grendel would come? No. He thought Grendel would keep on coming. When, stained with blood, this best of houses stood dripping glory, a widespread woe to all wise men who did not expect that they might ever defend the people's fortress from its foes. Now a retainer has done the very deed. Notice, through the might of God. You didn't do this on your own, Beowulf. God helped. Which we all could not contrive to do with all our cleverness. So what is Hrothgar actually saying there? And we tried to do it, and God didn't do it. Okay, so what would be the next logical question? Why does God hate us? Why didn't God 
kind of reach down and help us when we tried? Is it because they kept turning to pagan temples? Like, wrong direction, guys. <laughs> You're looking for help down there. You need to look up there, so to speak. Right? Lo, that woman could say, whoever has borne such a son into the race of men, if she still lives, that the God of old was good to her in childbearing. Okay, what woman is he talking about? Beowulf's mother. Okay. Does this sound like anything? Because I think it probably resonated to an Anglo-Saxon audience. Especially an Anglo-Saxon audience from around the time the manuscript that we have now was written. Meaning around 1000 AD. Where the audience is thoroughly Christian. In fact, they're more Christian than... 21st century America. Okay. It, Mary? Yes, it ought to echo Mary. Okay. And especially when Mary goes and visits Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says, What? <laughs> yeah. Blessed are you, you bear the Savior of mankind, etc. Notice what he says again. That woman could say, if she still lives, that the God of old was good to her in childbearing. Mary offers her magnificat. Blessed am I, she says. Okay. Now I will cherish you, Beowulf, best of men, like a son. And by the way, wasn't it Hrothgar who told us Beowulf's genealogy earlier? I remember him when he was a little boy. Old Hrethel gave his daughter in marriage to Edgedale. Okay. He should know who Hrethel's daughter's name is. But he doesn't name her. Because Baal's mother is not named. Okay. So. Now I'll cherish you like a son in my heart. When Wealthiel hears that. What she's told is. Hrothgar's going to adopt Baal. She has two sons. You shall have no lack of any worldly goods which I can bestow. Now, he says, line 955, may the Almighty reward you with good as he has already done. So Beowulf says, freely, gladly, have we fought this fight. Notice, we, Beowulf's given glory to his men. They helped. <laughs> Not really. They tried. They banged on Grindel, you know, they distracted him. Yeah, one was eaten, you know, he's... So he says, you know, I wanted to kill him and leave him here, but the creator did not wish that. The creator allowed him to escape. But he got a little comfort thereby, the pathetic creature, line 973. So, notice what Beowulf says. Grindel escaped, went off to his mirror, Line 977, and there he shall abide, guilty of his crimes, the greater judgment, how the shining maker wishes to sentence him. What did the poet, the voice behind Beowulf the poem say? Yeah, he's, he's burning in hell. Notice Beowulf doesn't say that. Beowulf says, it's up to God. I'm not going to judge anybody. Okay. Then the son of Edgelaf was more silent in boasting words. Who's the son of Edgelaf? Unferth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In other words, he's because mm -hmm. uh, Beowulf did exactly what he said he was going to do. Okay. So, they clean up the hall. Many men and women. And what do they do? What do the Danes do really well? Party. Okay? They party. They throw a feast. And we're told um, I'm skipping a bit. Line 10, 12. 10, 13. 
Those men in their glory moved to their benches, rejoiced in the feast. Fairly those kinsmen took many a full mead cup, stout-hearted in the high hall. I never noticed that actually before. They took many a full mead cup. A mead cup isn't a little, you know, cup. I mean, it's big. It, you know, holds 16 ounces or so of probably pretty strong mead. They take many of these in plaster, okay? And we're told, who are these kinsmen? Hrothgar and Hrothulf. Herod within was filled with friends. No false treacheries did the people of the Shieldings plot at that time. What is he talking about? Okay, yes. Let's draw the hall again. Let's draw this one, okay? We've got Hrothgar sitting here. Unferth is at his feet. Okay. Hrothulf is over here. And Welthal is probably over here, or she's moving around a little bit. Okay. Beowulf is sitting here opposite Hrothgar. Either side of Beowulf are Hrothgar's two sons, Hrethric and Hrothmund. Okay. Well, they're younger. They're 10, 12 years old. So, notice what we're told. Herod was filled with friends. No false treacheries did the people of the Shieldings plot at that time. And you've got a footnote. Implicit in this statement is the idea that at some later time, the people of the Shieldings did plot false treacheries. Well, yeah, duh. Okay. From other sources, that is from other Germanic literature, about the Shieldings... Or the Skjöldungs in Norse, it's possible to infer that after the death of Hrothgar, his nephew Hrothulf ruled rather than Hrethric, Hrothgar's son. That's a nice way of saying when Hrothgar died, Hrothulf usurped the throne. Okay, the throne should go to Hrethric, the eldest son. Okay, we're back in the line again, right? Skar takes Mufasa's throne, takes it away from Simba. Simba wants it, he's got to kill his uncle. This is probably that oath swearing, that the broken oaths that is referred to um, about in-laws, right? Hrothulf is actually Hrothgar's nephew, okay? So, notice the picture. Where's Unfer? He's at Hrothgar's feet. What did Beowulf tell us about Unfer? He's a kinslayer. He's a kinslayer. The worst thing you could be accused of in Anglo-Saxon England, in fact, in Germanic society. I mean, that, that is the absolute worst crime. Okay? And he's where? He's at the dead center of society. Okay, so... Something rotten in the state of Denmark, so to speak. So... Hrothgar gives Beowulf the blade of Halfdane. That is an heirloom blade. Hrothgar is the descendant of Halfdane. Halfdane is a famous Norse king. What else does he do? He gives him a whole bunch of treasure. Okay? In eight horses and all this kind of stuff. I'm going to skip a bunch. Um, go to Fit 16. Okay? So he'd given Beowulf all kinds of treasure. And we're told, line 1055, he, Beowulf, would have done more if wise God and one man's courage had not prevented that fate. That is, uh, sorry, not he, Beowulf, he, Grendel, would have done more. He would have killed more men if wise God and one man's courage had not prevented them. This is kind of getting back to the Boethius stuff. There is a word that gets bandied about all too often today. Synergy. What does it mean? Sin is with or together. Energy, energy, action. Okay. So what does it mean? To work together. Okay. To work together. 
So what's working together? One man's strength, Beowulf, and does Beowulf know he's working in tandem with God? No, he doesn't. Why? Because Beowulf's down here. He's just going along in life, you know, oh, look at there, there's a tribe of giants, I better kill them. Why? Because I'm a giant killer. I'm a monster killer. It's my job to rid the world of giants. Meanwhile, God up here, outside time, is going, yeah, I can use that. I can, I can work with that. And so, God, in human action, working in tandem. So, the maker will rule all of the race of mankind as he still does. Right. Notice, ruled. When is that? Past tense. Why? How does the poem begin? We have heard of the glory of the spear dance, the marvelous works they did in the past. Right? Dance. Almighty God ruled the race of mankind. Then, in the past, and then the poet speaking this poem says, as he still does. Who is he speaking to? The people out there listening right now to this poem. <coughs> so notice, we've heard that now twice. We're going to hear it two or three more times. So what might be one of the things the poet is trying to get across? God's in control, folks. Why might he be trying to get that across? Do you think it's possible, just possible here, theory-wise, that the poem is being told or possibly even being created at a time when there's not perfect peace in the world? Maybe there's some trouble going on. Maybe there are bombings in New York and stabbings in Minnesota, in other words, okay? So, therefore, understanding is always best. Spiritual foresight. He must face much, both love and hate, who long here endures this world in these days of strife. Notice, you must endure much. <laughs> endure. Do you really endure love? That's a weird <laughs> kind of usage. Depends on the love, I guess. I mean, if you're in an abusive relationship, it's not love. <laughs> okay? But you must endure. What does that mean? You have to be patient about it. Okay? But what do you endure? Love and hate. Okay? So the poet kind of goes, okay, getting off my soapbox now, back to the story. So what happens? There's revelry until the poet, that is, Hrothgar's show, stands up and tells a story. The story is frequently called the Finsburg episode. Finsburg episode. Interestingly enough, we have a fragment of a manuscript. Okay? The actual manuscript no longer survives, but a copy was made in the 18th century called the Finsburg Fragment. It tells part of the same story that is being told in the Bible. Right? It differs a little bit, but what is this story ultimately about? You have this, a guy named Finn. Okay. He's the leader of the Frisians. And then you have Fnaf, leader of the Danes, or Shieldings, if you want. Knaf okay. has a sister whose name is Hildeburg. She marries Finn. She and Finn have a son who's named Hawk. Right? Um, no, Hawk is there. They have a son whose name is Sindelpol. 
Okay, so Hildebrand is married off to Finn. Why? To bring peace between the Shieldings and the Frisians. Okay. So one day, Knaff and his men go to visit his sister, the Frisians. And one of the Frisians launches an attack. Okay. Now keep in mind, they go to visit, which means they're staying in the hall. Little kind of background thing. A belief that the Germanic tribes have. And this is a belief that all Indo-European peoples had, at least up until the modern period. All the Indo-European peoples, who do I mean? The Germanic peoples, the Italic peoples, the Celtic peoples, the Greek peoples, the Indian, you know, these kind of Indian people, not Native American, the Slavic peoples, that is Russians and such, all had this belief in hospitality. Okay? And the hospitality belief system was, if your enemy shows up at your doorstep and asks to come in, you are bound to give that person safe room and board. They're your enemy. Right? While they're at your castle or your stronghold, they are under your protection. All right? So, Knaff is kind of enemy, even though his daughter is given in marriage. His, I mean, his wife is sister, one of the three. His sister <laughs> is given in marriage to bring peace between the two. This is, you know, not a good, great way to obtain peace. So he goes to visit. He and his men are attacked. Okay? There is a wholesale slaughter. This is what's happening in lines 1068 or so, 1069, okay, through 1158. Okay. This is all the Finsburg episode. So, we're told. Knaff is killed, and we're told Hildebert had no need, line 1071, to praise the good faith of the Jutes. That's another name being used here for the Frisians, even though the Jutes and the Frisians are totally separate ge uh, geographically. Okay, So Knaff is killed, and the Frisians, Finn's people, <coughs> kind of sue for peace with the remainder of the Shieldings, probably because they're outnumbered, okay? and the Shieldings agree. So what happens is they divide the hall. The Frisians are going to spend the winter at this side, and the Shieldings are going to spend the winter on this side, and they're going to have peace. Okay? One of the reasons they do that is because the Shieldings can't get away because the rivers have frozen over wintertime. So they have peace, they swear oaths, okay? The Frisians kind of toast the Shieldings every night. They throw a party for them, part of this agreement. But spring comes, the rivers thaw, and the Shieldings get revenge. Why? For a dramatic ethic. Their king has been slaughtered. They get revenge. And the Frisians are wiped out. And Hildebur is taken back to the land of the Shieldings. And notice she's sorrowful. Why is she sorrowful? Because her husband's dead, her son is dead, her brother's dead. And the poet tells us this when? Right after Beowulf kills Grim. It's like, yay, happy story. Why is it that Beowulf just killed Grindel? Beowulf, what are you going to do? I'm going to Disney World. Or, you know. Instead, we get this kind of poem. Well, what's at the heart of it? Feud. Feud. What kind of feud? Interfamily. Okay. This is civil war. Literally, civil war. Right? 
Where is Wood Ferret sitting again? The living embodiment of family feud sitting at Rothgar's seat. Okay? So, they finish the speech and cup bearers come back in. Wealthy all comes back in. She then gives Beowulf treasure. Line um, actually, before at, let me back up. Before she gives Beowulf treasure, the speech ends, and we're told wealthy all comes forth in her golden crown to where the good two sat, nephew and uncle. Okay, nephew and uncle. Nephew, uncle. What are we told at the end of the Finsburg leg? These two killed each other. And they're burned on the same funeral pyre. So the poet ends with that. And then, where sat the two good nephew and uncle? And their peace was still whole then. What does that adverb still imply? It won't always be. Okay? Each true to the other. Likewise, Unferth sat at the foot of the shielding lord. Likewise, how? In that, these two would not always sit. Okay. Everyone trusted his spirit. His name means mar peace. I think Tolkien bases Grima Wormtongue on Unferth. Wormtongue does what? He spreads nothing but lies and falsehood. Okay. So, wealthy all comes in and says, take this cup, my noble courteous lord, that is, she's talking to Hrothgar, and says, and speak to the Geats in mild words as a man should do. Be gracious to them. Give them gifts. Um, I've been told you're going to adopt this one. She points to Beowulf. Okay, keep in mind, where's Beowulf sitting? He's sitting, yeah, right there across from Hrothgar with Wealthy owes two sons on either side of him. Hair on is cleansed. Use your rewards the way you can until you must go to the maker's decree. Uh, I know that my dear, gracious Rothel will hold and honors these youths if you should give up the world before him, friend of the shieldings. I expect that he would wish to repay both our sons kindly if he recalls all the pleasures and honors we have shown him. What is she saying or what is she doing? Rhetorically, what is she doing? Okay. Is she speaking to Hrothulf directly? No, she's speaking to Hrothgar. What does she say about Hrothulf? Oh, he'll be fair to our sons if he remembers the favors we've shown him all these years. Okay. That's how it's read on the surface. That's how I would say probably 99% of Anglo-Saxon scholars read it. Maybe I'm just a dirty, rotten bastard. Okay? That's not how I understand those lines. I read those lines as she is dripping with sarcasm. When she says, I know that my own dear, gracious brother will hold and honors these youths. She's saying... Trust him like a snake. Okay. Especially when it comes after what the poet has just said. The poet of the larger poem. That they as yet sat in peace. The context indicates to me, this is sarcasm. She's saying, I don't trust him. Okay. And then she turns to the bench where her boy sat, her other and Rothman. All the youths together. And Beowulf between them. I think she's also speaking not just to Rothgar and Hrothulf. She's also talking to Beowulf. Because later in the poem, after Beowulf kills Grendel's mother, so we'll stop with this, she's going to say something to Beowulf about watching her sons. And Beowulf says, hey, if your boys ever have any need of have any uh, need of help, I'll come at the head of a thousand armed men. 
You got that problem? You do anything against them, you got me to fight. All right. All right, we'll stop there. I don't quite do when you're saying I, I don't trust.